Um, I wanted to start by saying that I'm actually quite nervous. This is the first time that I've spoken publicly on this issue. Um, and I kind of wanted to start by saying my opinions are not a actually necessarily fixed. Um, I think that all of us need the space to discuss these issues, to hear each other's experiences and to formulate formulate our ideas and solutions to the problems that we face. Um, but it's absolutely critical that women are not excluded from this debate about the proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act. Um, it's also critical that women are not expected to meet perfection standards before they're allowed to open their mouths, mm -hmm. um, because basically they're required to meet those standards. Um, so, uh, just to say again, thank you for inviting me here to speak. Um, I was invited to, to speak here after being surrounded and threatened at, at a book fair by a mob of around 30 people um, who claimed to be advocating on behalf of trans people. Um, and this was, um, as, as has been mentioned, after I intervened to stop the bullying of two women who were distributing leaflets about the Gender Recognition Act and the proposed changes. Um, the government is planning to amend the Gender Recognition Act to allow anyone to self-identify as a man or a woman, um, and this gender identity will become a protected characteristic in law. And to me, it seems quite apparent that this um, has serious implications for women, because if it becomes law, effectively, it will make it impossible for any woman to challenge the presence of a male um, in women-only spaces, because to do so would put, put the woman at risk of being accused of discrimination against trans-identifying males. There is no reliable way for anyone to tell from external exp uh, appearances whether or not somebody identifies as trans. Um, so women would have to accept without question any man who entered women's toilets or changing rooms or any other women-only space. Um, clearly, this is a, a legal change the issue is one on which women should be free to discuss their fears and to be actively involved in the decision-making process about how any legal changes are, you know, are defined. Um, sadly, there are a significant number of trans advocates who seek to silence women entirely, refusing to acknowledge the reality of widespread sexism in today's society and its impact on those who are born female. At the book fair, Sorry, some of those who surrounded and threatened me at the book fair were also involved in a physical attack on a feminist at Speaker's Corner um, when women met there in September after trans activists successfully bullied a venue into closing down a debate about the proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act. I was lucky enough um, that people stepped in to defend me from attack at the book fair, um, but the mob that surrounded me shouted at abuse at me for over an hour and they would not leave me alone and it was an extremely intimidating experience and then since the book fair um, I and those who stepped in to protect me from the attack have been sub subjected to a sustained bullying campaign of lies smears and even death threats um, and all of this is for women basically holding opinions which those trans activists disagreed with but rather than focusing on the bullying now, I'd actually like to start by talking about why I value women-only spaces, because I think that the life experiences of those born female and the discrimination which we face in our day-to-day -day lives is the part of the debate which is not being heard. So to move on to how, how all of this affects women, um, despite the recent Me Too reports, most men still have no idea just how commonplace sexual harassment is for those who are born female or of the impact that it has on our lives and our feelings of safety. It is treated as a joke or a bit of harmless banter or as if we should see it as a compliment which de somehow demonstrates our worth. My first recollection of sexual harassment is when I was 10 years old. I was out playing with some girlfriends in woods near where I lived and a man approached us exposed his penis and started masturbating a short distance away. We had to stop playing and leave the woods to get away from him. We weren't allowed to play in the woods again on our own, so I lost some of my freedom to that man's sense of entitlement. Then when I was 12, I was abducted from beside a hotel swimming pool where I'd been swimming with a family friend who was another girl who was actually younger than me. 
A man asked me to come to his hotel room for a drink. He put his arm around me, around my shoulder, and guided me to the lifts. I was too scared to resist or to say anything. When we reached the third floor, he guided me out of the lifts along the corridor. I was really lucky to escape when some other people appeared and I managed to break through and run into the lift with them just as the doors closed. But I lost some more of my freedom to that man's sense of entitlement. I tried really hard from then on to avoid being alone in places where there were unknown men. When I was 16, I was walking home from my job in a supermarket in the dark with my hood up. I was grabbed by my breasts from behind, pinning my arms to my side. When I struggled to escape, the man ran off into a park which was right beside where he'd assaulted me. Friends told me that I should report it to the police. I did, and they weren't interested. They didn't even take a statement. I learnt to modify my behaviour and never walk with my hood up after dark, even if it was raining and I wanted to stay dry. Around this time, walking home with a female friend in daylight, a man stopped in our, in our line of sight, got out his penis and began masturbating in front of us. Then when I was 17 and I'd moved to South London, a male stranger reached out and grabbed my left breast as I walked down the street in broad daylight. When I was 18 and living in North London, the same thing happened again during the day on a busy high road. And another time, as I waited for a bus to pull into the local bus station where I wanted to get off, a man put his hand on top of mine on the support pole. He pressed his body against me. Twice I moved my hand from under his and he moved his back on top of my hand again. And besides all of that, there were at least three incidents I can remember of men exposing their penises while I was sitting on fairly deserted tube trains, which were quite intimidating. When I, was eight, when I was 19, I lived in a shared house. One night, just after I had gone to bed, one of the men who lived there came into my room, got into bed, got on top of me, and started kissing me and giving me love bites on my neck. I managed to slide out, and I slept on the floor instead. Too socialised into subservience to ask why the heck he thought he was entitled to get into my bed and do that without being invited. And besides all of that, and besides the sexual harassment at work or touching up in pubs and social spaces, there were the count countless leery comments and sexist remarks as I walked along the street, especially past pubs or building sites or any other place where lots of men congre were congregated. And if I ever answered back or challenged any of this, I was called a bitch or a slag or, or worse. All of those experiences taught me to be ever alert to danger. It could come at any time when I was least expecting it, but all from males. It's not all men, but it is a very significant number, and they don't come with abuser stamped on their forehead, so women have no way of telling in advance. This is why I, and so many other women, really value women-only spaces, as a respite from the ever-present risk of attack from self-entitled males. Women are particularly vulnerable to sexual harassment and assault when we are in a state of partial undress, in toilets, changing rooms, fitting rooms. That's why it's important to so many women to preserve these spaces as women only. We know that if a man enters those spaces, we really need to be on our guard. It makes our time there much more stressful. But if the law is changed so that any male can identify as a woman, we will no longer be able to challenge the presence of men in those spaces. And many women will end up avoiding using the facilities rather than run the risk of being harmed. My experiences are not unique, and in fact many women have endured much worse at the hands of men. So it's both irresponsible and offensive when prominent trans advocates like Paris Lees have articles in national newspapers which portray women as irrational bigots. Here's one of them. Fears around gender-neutral toilets are all in the mind, Paris Lees. Um, so, it, yeah, sorry. So it's both irresponsible and offensive when prominent trans advocates like Paris Lees have articles in national newspapers which portray women as irrational bigots for being concerned about what might happen if trans advocates get their way and the definition of women changes from adult human female to anybody who, def who, anybody who identifies as a woman. 
There are endless articles which appear in news, major newspapers in support of transgender ideology which repeatedly downplay women's oppression and deny the reality of sexism. They never repeat the reality that every year around 400,000 women are sexually assaulted and 80,000 women raped in the UK. That 79% of women aged 18 to 24 report sexual harassment is the norm on nights out. That at least 80 women a year in the UK are killed by violent men and that at least one in three women experience domestic abuse in their lifetimes. Anyone who has respect for women and our lived experiences and who is opposed to sexism should not be attempting to silence women who want to talk about the risks of allowing men to self-identify as women and thereby gain entrance to women's spaces. Preserving women-only wards in hospitals as well when women are ill and vulnerable are also, is, is also critical, as, as is preserving refuges as women-only spaces um, to allow women to recover from male violence. Sorry. Um, sorry. Women are oppressed in our society on the basis of being the female sex. We don't choose our sex, it's a biological fact. People are not assigned a gender at birth, we are categorised according to our visible sex organs. This is useful in terms of acknowledging that we will experience different health issues throughout our lives, but it otherwise shouldn't dictate what we can do or where. Instead, society attempts to, to enforce gender stereotypes which are a socially constructed hierarchy used to facilitate the dominance of men and subservience of women. The stereotypes promoted tell us that girls like pink and boys like blue and that girls are valued for being pretty while boys are valued for their actions. As we get older, the stereotypes encourage us to think that men are better suited to physical tasks, decision-making and power, while women's main purpose is still to look attractive to men and to put men's desires before their own and to take on most of the caring and cleaning within the family and within wider society too. Feminists view these gender norms as oppressive stereotyping, so we want to destroy them, break them down. But it appears that those advocating for, for transgender um, rights uh, appear to make, want to make those stereotypes real, but instead to have individual ability to choose which stereotype to adopt. More recently, some seem to believe it's actually possible to even change sex purely by identifying as a different sex. This is a conflict of ideologies. The biggest conflict lies over the use of the word woman and the demand that females adopt the prefix cis before the word women. Throughout history and according to the dictionary, the word woman means adult human female. Adult human female cannot include male. For women to make this statement now, however, is, is described as hate speech and bigotry. There is clearly a difference in lived experiences between those born female and those born male. One obvious example is that no male will ever have to cope with periods or run the risk mm. of pregnancy. In the new vocabulary, the terms trans and cis are then used to distinguish between males who, call them, who identify as, as women, trans, and women who were born female, cis. Um, However, the, the definition of cis is someone whose gender identity fits the sex that they were born. I and many other women see the word cis as a term of oppression. Mm -hmm. Not only is it inaccurate, we have been fighting the feminine gender stereotypes throughout our lives, but also it's diametrically opposed to our belief as gender, of, of gender as a tool of sexist oppression, where expected gender gendered behaviour stereotypes are used to enforce that hierarchy where, where men are dominant and women are submissive. And finally, it's actually used to invert reality and claim that males who want to identify as women are actually more oppressed than women who had no choice about being born female and who have endured that subservient, sta subservient status since birth. Some women say that they don't mind being called cis. That's up to them. It may be that they don't fully understand what, what the implications are. But if they, if they, even if they are happy to be called cis, they can't consent on behalf of all women mm. to uh, the adoption of that word prefix. 
I think everyone would accept that there are differences in the experience, experiences of those born and socialised as female and those born and socialised as male, but who say that they identify as women. So there needs to be a way to, de to describe that difference. Why do men get to appropriate the word women and force females to use the term cis women? It basically comes down to male privilege and a male sense of entitlement and male dominance and male control. Throughout history, women have been the possessions of men. Fathers gave away daughters on marriage mm. until... Still doing it. They do, not frequently, yeah. <laughs> until 1882, women weren't even allowed to own property. Uh, until 1994, women weren't allowed to have a job once they were married. Even when they got a job, they were paid less. And despite the Equal Pay Act of 1971, they frequently still paid less. Uh, until 1991... Women were not entitled to refuse sex once they were married. Uh, it wasn't classified as rape. Women were considered to be the possession of their husbands. So men have always felt, or very many men, have always felt a sense of entitlement to women. It continues with the groping, the catcalling, the masturbating in front of us, the making rape jokes, the talking over us, the demeaning us. It's not all men, but it is a very significant number and as I said before, they don't come with labels on their heads, so we can't, we can't tell who is and who isn't an abuser. Women need to be able to set boundaries for our own safety. All in all, forcing women... Sorry. All in all, forcing women to accept a new definition of our reality so that some men can call themselves women just replicates the gender norms of male domination and female submission, and it cannot be considered remotely progressive. It prevents women from accurately describing and fighting the sexism endemic in our society. Women are socialised to be nice and to be accommodating. We want to try and make people feel welcome. But actually, why should we trust those who show literally zero respect for our experiences when they repeatedly assert that there's no danger to women from self-identification and the, and the removal of our ability to, to um, challenge men entering women-only spaces. The experiences of me and other women being bullied over this issue just make me feel even stronger that it's really important to stand up and fight on this issue. Um, and I would just like to finally encourage everybody to stand against this bullying. It is actually really quite intimidating to be met with this. It, I've been a campaigner for over 35 years and I have never encountered such a toxic, uh, a aggressive atmosphere as there is around the, this discussion. Um, it really is designed to intimidate women into silence and it's absolutely critical that as many people as possible stand together and stand up against this bullying. Um, those trans activists and allies who are carrying out the bullying can be defeated by growing numbers of people resisting that bullying and that will facilitate a proper space for the concerns of women and trans identifying people to be discussed and I would suggest that rather than replicating gender stereotypes and suggesting that as individuals we try to choose our way out of them, which isn't in reality possible, that we all get together and break down those gender stereotypes and just let us all be individuals who fulfil our potential and choices, irrespective of whether we're male or female. Thank you.